Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Post Mortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Welcome to the Bare Naked ABCs, where we cover every single Bare Naked Lady song from 7 to Y in alphabetical order. And this week we don't have Aaron. He came in the studio, looked at me... It was almost like he was considering talking to me, and then he said, you know what, I'm going to walk, and he just turned around and walked out the door. Not sure what that was about, but hopefully it's a step toward reconciliation. I'm ready to, to bury the hatchet, not in his back, and figure out what I did wrong and apologize to him. I know he takes his music very seriously. We still don't have Michelle. She's still on hiatus for a while. But with me tonight, we have Catherine Cornetta, another week in a row. Thank you for joining me again, Catherine. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be doing this again. <laughs> well, last week when you were talking and you're like, Grinning Streak is my, my favorite quartet album. And I'm like, Oh, that's funny, because next week we're actually covering one off from Grinning Street. So this week's song, I haven't announced it yet, is Gonna Walk off the Grinning Streak album, or at least that's the first time we hear it, in 2013. Um, it is a Kevin Griffin and Ed Robertson tune. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with the song, I'm going to play a snippet of it right here. Gonna walk, I won't quit, won't quit until I get the bottom of your heart I would dare to say that this is their most popular song off this album given that they play it every single night on tour I think the last oh <laughs> how many years I would I would have to say it is and it's interesting because this was not one of their singles off this album I I wondered about that. <laughs> I'm like, you play it all the time, but yet you did not make it a single. Yeah. Well, I almost wonder if they didn't realize what they had on their hands when they wrote it and they decided to release it, or if this was a studio decision. But I think they're done with studios. I think they make their own decisions these days. And so I almost want to say, like, this was a, like, I don't think we knew what we had on our hands and how catchy this tune was going to be to our audiences. It might have been one of those situations where... They got every song into the rotation, then started playing this one and was like, oh, actually, this really resonates live when we're having fun playing it live. So let's keep going. Let's see how much, it, you know, how much we can get out of this live. And then they've gotten a lot of mileage out of it. Oh, a lot of mileage. They've played this 327 times in concert in just the six years since they've written it. Wow. Oh my god. That is a that has to be every single concert. I didn't obviously have time to go down through every single concert that they've had and, and compare it. I mean that would take quite the time. But three hundred and twenty seven in six years has gotta be every concert. I think so. I mean, I imagine there are like you know how they do those like paid gigs now for like software companies when they go play a convention. I, I imagine this might not make that set list. But it sounds like it makes every single other set list. Oh, definitely. I would even reach and say that this is their new, if I had a million dollars of their live shows. Oh, yeah. Well, and when you look at, and I'm sure we'll get to this later on. But when you look at the structure of the song, it's very old, BNL. It is. Yes. 
It's actually one of the things I like about it. It does sound like old B and L. It sounds like like their their authentic sound. Yeah, and it, it sounds like you could take Steve and kind of insert him in, and you wouldn't. You'd be like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's totally a Steve and Ed song." Like it, it sounded like it was. This was pre Steve departure. It would have been like a Steve Ed duet, or yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And they would have had them doing the harmonies in the background and, and all this. And Here's the interesting thing, and I didn't even pick up on it. We've discussed this a number of times. So this was written by Kevin Griffin and Ed Robertson. Kevin Griffin from Better Than Ezra. It, it's very interesting that so Stephen used to write all, a bunch of songs with Stephen Duffy. He used to coordinate and, and co-write with Stephen Duffy quite a bit until we hit everything to everyone. At which point, it almost seemed like the band was like, "Nope, we're not, we're not collaborating anymore." All all songs written in the band. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that was a Stephen decision, a band decision, or or what. But Stephen did then, at that same time, go out and write his whole other album with Stephen Duffy, of a collaborative album. So I don't know if that was necessarily a Stephen decision. But then, as soon as Stephen left. We find Ed collaborating not just with bandmates, but with people from outside the band and bringing in other inspirations. Mm -hmm. No, that was the end of my thought. Oh, isn't there, and now I should have looked this up before we started talking. Isn't there a article that Ed, an interview that Ed did that talked about collaborating with Kevin Griffin? And he talks about why he started work. They went to some like, songwriters boot camp in nashville or something kevin griffin said last year 2018 that ed and him are birds of a feather we are roughly the same age we are both massive rush fans we have the same sense of humor we hit it off so well our crews get along great so, and I would say their writing styles are very similar as well. Yes. And I did not get into Better Than Ezra. I'm a bad 90s kid in that I think I just like, turn, <laughs> like I, I had tunnel vision and did not listen to them in the 90s. And I don't know why. And then when Ed and Kevin started collaborating, I started listening to more Better Than Ezra. And you, there's a marked difference in... Ed and like post Ed better than Ezra songs. Like they are very like they had a song that came out in 16 that is like a derivative of one week. And it kind of blipped on on satellite radio. And I was like, I remember hearing it and saying, oh, yeah, that must have been an Ed one. So (laughs) so there's definite like areas when you say, oh, yeah, that's an Ed and Kevin song. And that's an Ed and Kevin song. Right. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, this is off Grinning Streak, but it's not just off Grinning Streak. They actually have three different versions out there on their proper albums. So there's Grinning Streak, Bare Naked Ladies Rocks Red Rocks. I can never say that one right. <laughs> Gonna walk, I won't quit, until I get to the bottom of your heart. You got it. Folks, look around. Anyone who's not singing in the choruses is a racist. And the bare naked ladies and the persuasions. If it's a puzzle I can solve, I'll find a way to find you. I wouldn't mind you. I will muscle my resolve and every day I'm walking away, I'm never gonna stray. So we have three different versions of this, sort of. Although the Red Rocks one is kind of similar to the grinning streak version Mm -hmm. before we get too much into the grinning streak version did you have a chance to listen to the persuasions or the red rocks versions i listened to both of them and i have a a very strong favorite amongst all three versions all right what is it let's start this off with a confession i had not listened to any of the persuasions album prior to this week okay and maybe this revokes my BNL fan card. <laughs> but I've had a very busy couple of years. And this one just flew completely under the radar. And I was when I was preparing for this, I was like, oh, gosh, darn it. Maybe not those exact words, but let's say that. <laughs> I, and, 
you avoided the Yoko lo- the Yoko Yoda yeah. right there. So good job. Uh, <laughs> and realize, okay, I have completely missed this album. And after listening to Gonna Gonna Walk with the Persuasions, I very much regret having not listened to this album. It takes going <laughs> Gonna Walk to a completely different level. It is so enjoyable. Right. It is fantastic. And I feel like yeah. as someone who I advise a college acapella group at work. And oh, I nice. feel like, now mind you, I'm tone deaf, but not really tone deaf. Like I've been around music my whole life. I can play piano, but I can't sing. Singing is not one of my strong suits. <laughs> and yet this group said 10 years ago that they want me to be an advisor. And I was like, sure, okay. Maybe it's because I'm really good at paperwork. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, that being said, I feel like if this persuasions version of going to walk of gonna walk was more popular or was more put out into the mainstream, this song would be like an A plus college acapella song. You would see every acapella group along the East Coast, the Yazzle Bugs, my my dear Abbeys, my you know, like if a capella, you would see them all, the big all men groups, jump in and sing this song. Oh, and now, yeah. like, I'm going to take it to the president of the, my, the group I advise and be like, have you ever heard this? Because <laughs> when you listen to this version with the Persuasions, who are an a cappella group, you just, it's a whole different song. It's so good. It is. It's so good. I mean, it was great before, but it takes it to another level. So I'm really, I, I was, it was amazing. I completely agree. Like this, the, the Persuasions version is easily my favorite version of the song. And that's hard for me to say because I really like the original version. And I, I'm not a big fan of all the songs on the Persuasions album. I grew up listening to like the Temptations and the Spinners and all, all those big groups. And I, and I have gone back and listened to some of the Persuasions stuff and I love it. But I have to say like, I I was hoping with the Persuasions album, when they were going to do this compilation, that there was going to be, they were going to take these songs and go in a completely different direction on some of them, which they have. There's there's some of them that they really kind of took and they built on and they made it this whole other thing. This is one of those songs that I feel that they did that really well with. Um, and they found those harmonies and it gives it another level of soul behind this song. I, I also love that in this version, in the Persuasions version, Kevin's piano is right up front. Mm-hmm. In the Grinning Streak version, it's very laid back. For almost you, you almost can't hear Kevin playing. Although if you really listen, then you can hear it coming through, and it's a nice little extra flavor. Persuasions version, it is the front instrument being played ne- right next to Ed's guitar, and it blends so beautifully with all of the harmonies that the persuasions are throwing in i love harmonies anyways especially when they're used in and to make a song pop in certain spots um and bare naked ladies is amazing at doing that that being said they're all tenors (laughs) there's a couple tenor ones there's a couple tenor twos but they're all tenors maybe it might be close to a baritone but for the most part no like they're they're tenors yeah adding the baritone and the bass into this song give it so much flavor oh mm-hmm. my goodness <laughs> yeah and and the bass was especially at the end that was what blew me away i was like this song it's a whole different song when you can add on the layer of voices and you can add on the different you know vocal families and it just it really is it's a shame that most and then i did some more look at the persuasions i had been to the concert right after one of them had passed away and Ed made a remark about it, but I didn't realize most of them have now passed on. Correct. Like one just passed away this summer. And so that's a shame because I would have loved to see this live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and they did do a very small tour of them live. Mm -hmm. And and like I said, it was a very small tour. I think it was only six cities. I want to say, that they actually did live with the persuasions, which you know it's a it's a real shame. The good news is I have for this week's appearances, I have two major appearances that I'm gonna add in here, one of which is the studio version of, of their live performance that they did for the CBC. They only do six songs, 
but it's really great to watch them do those six songs. Matter of fact, at, when I'm in the shower every morning, that's what I like turn on to listen to when I'm when I'm like relaxing to get ready for the day. Wait, do you um, have one of those shower radios? No, I just put it outside my uh, my <gasps> uh, my countertop and listen to it that way. <laughs> do you remember when that was like a big deal? Like your grandmother used to have the catalog that you and it would be like of all the random electronics goods of the 80s and they'd be like shower radio listen to your favorite songs in the radio i mean in the shower and i would be like nana you can do that and and she never bought it so and i never found the catalog anywhere else but my nana's house but yeah that was whoo that was mind-blowing technology for 1993 (laughs) well the bathroom is a perfect place to be able to listen to like the persuasions, which are, you get that nice, wonderful echo from all of their voices all at once. Like, it's a beautiful sound. I can imagine, yeah. And then the other one I have, and and you might actually be interested in this, I did not go in and purchase this um, just because I don't have the money for it right now. So sometime in the next year, probably, before I come up to another um, song off this album, uh, we will be covering another song off the album next week, but not in the next week, but within the next year, I hope to go out and purchase this. They did a whole set for what they call Session X, which is a company that will set will go in and record them doing different songs, and then they'll post the videos up online, but you have to pay to get Session X. There is an amazing trailer that I'm going to post today that, that shows them talking for like 10, 15 minutes about how this came together why they chose to do these songs and why they chose to, to spend time with each other and what they like about each other, about each of their band's time with Lou Reed and how that formed them. It's a great video, so I'm going to po- post that today. But if people want, they can go out and purchase the Session X membership. It's like 6 bucks a month and then 60 bucks a year or something like that. And you can get a seven-day free trial. My plan, of course, is to do the cheap thing and get the seven-day free trial and then cancel. But that means actually having the time to sit down and listen to all 20 different videos that they have posted on there from this, just the Persuasions recordings. And that, I mean, you have to pick the right week to have those seven days. And Correct. whenever whenever you go to do something like that, I know from personal experience, you always pick the worst seventh day. To do oh, it. of course. Yeah. You like like as soon uh, as you pick it, like you'll lose lose your your video for the week, or you'll lose your computer for the week, or something. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I'll be posting those. I think you'll enjoy them. Like it, the video of, a, of the trailer alone is worth it to just enjoy watching them talk about this. And speaking about them talking about this is the live version from Red Rocks, uh, the album that they created live when they were touring with Colin Hay. I like what Ed is doing at the beginning of the song. And I enjoy listening to them playing it live, but I can't obviously play that with the kids in the car because then they're like, Daddy, what's a racist? I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's a loaded question to start on today. Yes. Um, <laughs> the great thing about the video that I'm going to post around this is I love watching these guys play, especially Jim playing live is a treasure. Mm-hmm. I think what was interesting to me was how forward, how front and center Jim was on that Red Rocks live version, which Mm. the Red Rocks version is very similar to every time I've seen them play this song live. But I don't think I'd ever noticed how prominent Jim was on that, on this song. And next time I see them live, I'll definitely be looking for that. This look at his role and, and really pay more attention to his role on the song when they play it live. (laughs) Um, But that really struck me. I was like, Oh, Jim is right there. Jim is singing really strong here. Jim, like, this is like yeah. a gym time. <laughs> well, that just sounds weird. But you know what I mean. Yeah. Not like, not playing basketball gym time, but Jim Cregan time. <laughs> My two favorite people to watch when I go to see them live are Jim and Kevin. I love to just sit down there and just go back and forth watching the two of them playing, depending on what song it is. Mm-hmm. I agree. So we don't have Aaron this week. I don't have a breakdown of the song. I don't know a lot about the musical piece, uh, what key it's in, or anything like that. I could look it up, but once again, Toonbat has been wrong in the past, and I'm I'm less willing to kind of lean on that right now. Um, I'm hoping I, that right here we'll post in Aaron's thoughts on the on the song. 
But that being said, let's go back for a second and just talk about the the sound because you were mentioning how this sounds like the old B and L. Yes, and it and I think maybe it's the call and response part. Um, maybe it's mm-hmm. the upbeat nature. The other thing is, and we spoke about this last time. There are different expectations of Ed's voice pre Steve departure and post Steve departure. And Gonna mm-hmm. Walk is very much in the, keeps Ed, Ed's voice in the range where it always was when Steve was around. I think it also becomes a mainstay of their set list because it doesn't require a lot of Ed's voice. It's a, he can sing it, he can take the end, he can go as wild as he wants vocally on the end if he's feeling good, or he can do it at a normal level. I think it's what we expect of Ed's voice from the olden days. Yeah, it's right in his wheelhouse. It's right in that right tone for him where he's not stretching. He's just enjoying what he's throwing out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I'm going to break my rule. I did look it up on Toonbat. It's an A major, which is just one key above where his his he usually goes. Like a lot of his songs are kind of in G. Um so this isn't that much of a stretch for him. This is this is right in his wheelhouse. And it's a really upbeat tune. Like it's 125 beats per minute, and that's that's pretty good and quick pace there. Mm-hmm. It it's is. A, it's a fun pace. Yeah, and it gets you know if you when you see him live, the way I there was one time I saw them and I thought they played this a little too early, but it's the perfect middle of the set song. Where you've played a couple new things, you've played a couple old things, and we're like 30 minutes in, and let's get everybody involved. I once saw... It's time to get the audience. Yeah. I've once seen them make this like the third or fourth song, and it just did not work. It was... No, too early. Yeah, way too early. So uh, it really is... The pace of it uh, really keeps people... Gets people re-engaged in the concert. I agree. As you probably know, the Grinning Streak on Spotify has a tune-by-tune, song-by-song breakdown. And Ed had this to say about this song. Um, It was very short. It It was the shortest intro I've heard for any of their songs. But his commentary was, This song is fun and reminiscent of like the second Proclaimers record. Um, It's got like a Scottish dance band vibe. It's Dexie's Midnight Runners meets the Proclaimers meets the Cars. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm like, wow, well, how many bands are you trying to fit in there, there, Ed? <laughs> okay. But I can hear that, especially the Proclaimers piece. Like, it really does kind of have that, How to, I don't know how to put it into words, but it really does sound very Proclaimers. Yeah, it does. I mean, it. From what I know of them, it does sound like it would fit right in. Like, if you were doing Spotify and you put it on random, it would come right after um, I would walk 500 miles. Right. Yeah. I'm going to walk 500 miles. Going to walk. <laughs> I, I don't think Ed did that on purpose, but... <laughs> Quite possibly. Who knows? So that's all I really have to say about the music. I mean, the music is pretty spot on. It's pretty clear about what instruments are kind of playing. And you can't really pick up online like, oh, they've got this one that they threw in there or this one they threw in there. I don't hear a lot of extra music that they're throwing in. This isn't a wall of sound type song. They love the, the callback, the call and answer of the song. And that's the more important piece. Yes. So why don't we get to the lyrics and talk a little bit about what the lyrics are. It's a very simple premise. (laughs) Um, Going back to Gonna Walk 500 Miles by the Proclaimers, it's like I'm going to keep, like, it's I'm going to do anything I have to do in order to keep this person that I love in my life. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple theme that he just kind of keeps to throughout the whole song. Yes. There's no multiple meanings here. It is very... This is not, you will be waiting with the multiple layers involving right. Canadian politics and everything like that. No, no, no. This is very straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not war on drugs. This is not <laughs> fun and games. This is like, I'm just going to make this really happy, upbeat song, which I think we discussed before, like that upbeat song is kind of what 
their later stuff is kind of about. And and some of their songs, I really like it for that. And some of the songs, I don't like it because it feels like they're repeating it too much on one theme. This is one of those songs that I really like. I think it's a good, upbeat, powerful song to make you feel good. And it works for that reason. Yes. And I think it's a good gateway song. So if you're if you're coming to the band late and you later in its existence and you listen to this song, this might give you kind of the pull to get more involved. Like I could, this appeals to a lot of people. I mentioned this last time. Um, I think I, my husband didn't start coming to see Barry Naked Ladies concerts until we got married. And this song has become like, the one song that he knows. Like, this is the one song that he can <laughs> he can sing or that I'll catch him humming or something like that. Like, and this is a, you know, it, he listens to Dean Martin usually. So, <laughs> so for this to resonate with him when he, this isn't even the genre of music that he would l- usually listen to, um, I think it really provides that kind of gateway song for newer fans. Oh, oh definitely. And and for like the newer generation, I think this would be catchy too and and kind of engaging. Mm-hmm. And it really is an earworm. Like it's one of those songs that once you hear it, you can't get it out of your head. Yeah. And it's it's simple. Like there's no deep deep metaphors that he's going for with this. Uh, I'm looking down through the we- lyrics, and he uses some metaphors, but they're nothing that you have to like sit there and like puzzle over. Um, ironically, um, and try to figure out. And I say ironically because for people who don't get that one, when you get to the bridge, first sentence is, if there's a puzzle I can solve uh, to find the way to find you, I wouldn't mind to. (laughs) Um, Once again, by the way, the lyrics that are online follow up, say, I will muzzle my resolve. And every day I'm walking away. I'm never going to stray. No, I'm. I will muscle yeah. my resolve. I will. I will pull it together. I will use my strength. I'm not going to muzzle it. I'm not going to keep it down. That's not the point of the song. Oh, so yeah. I love it when people try to get the lyrics right. <laughs> I mean, I. It's the exact opposite of muzzle that he's going for <laughs> right there. And <laughs> throughout the, the whole song, yeah. And if the people who wrote the lyrics, well, okay, the people who write the lyrics for these lyric sites are probably using an AI at this point. Mm-hmm. And I could see, like, for instance, I used an AI, uh, like a, something called otter.ai the other day to transcribe a video, uh, not a video, an audio interview I had done. And they had said the word lift as in lifting weight because it was a hockey coach. And the AI spelled it lifts like the car sharing service or the car riding service. <laughs> I'm like, we aren't even, no, no, we are lifting not- weights, not summoning a car. <laughs> so I think that's where these lyric mistakes now come from. Before, it was definitely human error. Now it's machine error. Yeah, which is sad. I'd rather have human error. It's funnier that way. Yes, <laughs> yes it is. When we used to get lyrics wrong all the time, there was some humor to it. Yes. There's a bunch of famous songs that everyone thinks the oh. lyrics are, and like, saying the lyrics for. And now, you know, if this was, like, I'll remember them all in about 12 hours. Oh, yeah. But I can't remember any of them right now. Oh, the list of, <laughs> of long, wrong lyrics. Like, Elton John is known for, like, writing lyrics that people cannot immediately understand immediately but at the same time like they're wonderful yes <laughs> oh top top 20 misheard lyrics okay what's number one let's see if i can find what number one is okay every time you go away every time you go away you taste a take a piece of meat with you no 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 no, no. <laughs> that close. one's always no. been clear to me <laughs> That one I've never misunderstood. Like, yeah. I don't know how people have gotten... Like, some of these I sit there and read, I'm like, I am horrible at hearing lyrics correctly. I'm looking at these and going, how could anyone ever get any of these ones wrong? So now that <laughs> begs the question, and maybe this is a future episode, once you get through the alphabet. 
or maybe it's like a break from the alphabet. What are the 10 most misheard BNL lyrics? Oh. Ooh. I think we should start a meme, and or not a meme, but a, 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 a quiz online and see what people can come up with. So people go out there onto Facebook and, and put down what are the top, top 10 most misheard BNL lines. I want to see what people come up with. And try to not have them all be from one week. Yes. I mean, no, that's <laughs> – let's have none from one week because let's face it, like, that one is a given. Like, people are messing up lines from that all the time. Yes. <laughs> yes. But any others? I'd love to hear what people, like, used to think that lyrics were for BNL songs. This will, this will be interesting. I like this. What is your favorite lyric from this song? I would have to say that's an excellent question. I like the walk in hour after hour. If I could walk, use a walking superpower, I would. Because I, I too, would get a walking superpower if I could. <laughs> I think that is the funniest line in the song. I I totally agree. Like, I don't know where he's just like, yeah, that's a superpower, walking. Like, I, I'd use that to come and find you. Like, that that's a superpower, right? Yeah. Because it is, it is, it is a very, it, like, especially if you're a race walker, it's a superpower because there it are is. some crazy rules in that, in, in race walking. Oh, yeah. in order to legitimately race walk, the rules behind that are so incredibly difficult and intricate. Mm -hmm. Like they actually have to have people judging them on a whole different level and have people at all four corners of the track to prove that they didn't race, that they're not doing it incorrectly. Says that, that I did race walk. It used to be an event in the, uh, in New York state. It used to be a varsity track event. And I got disqualified once because they said I ran, I jogged for three steps. And I'm like, come on. Like, really? <laughs> Three steps? I don't think I jogged. I was not. I did not think I was jogging. I was not purposely jogging. Maybe you tripped? I, very possible. I came in last every other race. So. <laughs> it is very My possible. daughter is a race walker. Oh, wait. They have it in Maine? Yes. That's awesome. Oh, Massachusetts needs to add it. I really think they do. It's an amazing event. I love watching the race walkers. It's really cool. Yes, it is. It is the I'm, best. The best. Unfortunately, event. some of them can get really super competitive, though, and, and then start like cutting people off and trying to push them out of bounds. Elbowing. It can, you got to. It can be almost like roller derby at times. You got to have some sharp elbows when you do race walk. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Still didn't help, but I did. For the little ones, they have rules like you're not allowed to cut anyone off. You have to give them at least a person's distance in front and in back. Like, it's it's pretty insane rules. Huh. Well, that's nice, though. It's not as Yeah, good. I mean, they want them to be competitive but not be mean and cruel to each other, So, yeah. which is good. Yeah. So, yes, I agree with you. Walking it can be a superpower, especially speed walking. Yeah. Race walking. So why don't we put some numbers to this song? Are you going to figure out how many times they say gonna walk? <laughs> no, I that would. I wish I had sat down and counted that out. That would be... I'm counting it right now. Not as many times as you would think. Oh, really? 11. 11 times. Mm -hmm. That's it? That's all. Let me double check. Yeah. Only 11 times. And that's with the call and answer. Ah, I was just going to say, does that include the call and answer part of it? Yeah. Okay. But that also, now that I think of it, doesn't surprise me because they actually, for the call and answer piece, they do the whole verse instead of like the, ver the I mean, the whole chorus, instead of the chorus being like saying the same thing over and over and over again, they have to go through the whole chorus to get back around to the gonna walk. Mm -hmm. That might be more of why it feels that way. Putting some numbers to this is going to be difficult this week. And, and even worse is going to be trying to pick a label for our numbers. I am going to go. So Ed said that this song reminds him. It was written kind of as a proclaimers type thing. I'm going to ask us how many miles does this song give us? We're not going to go with 500 miles because that would really throw off all our numbers. But zero to five, how many miles do we give this song? 
Um, and if you want, I can start. I I think I I have it four four. I'm I feel generous this week. I was gonna say last week you gave three point seven five, so that's pretty that's pretty generous four. Yes. I have to look at what else is on this album. And what I've given the other songs that are on this album. Because I want to compare it because it kind of has... The songs in this album all kind of have a very similar kind of feel for the most part. Um, But I also feel like this is the strongest song on this album. Hmm. We got Bring It Home. We got Every Subway Car. What did you give... Uh, um, Did I say that out loud? Nope, that's Blacking Out. I gave Blacking Out a higher one than than Did I Say That Out Loud. I could see that. Uh, Which is funny, because it's not on the album proper. Did I Say That Out Loud, I gave a 3.33. And Blacking Out, which even though it wasn't on the album, I still feel like this is a stronger song than Blacking Out. Okay, Blacking Out, I gave a 3.75. I feel comfortable saying, you know, I'm going to reach, I'm going to say this since it's the strongest one on this album, it is probably one of the strongest songs of their latter day albums. It's definitely the song I love hearing in concert every time it comes up. I'm going to give this a four. I I think it's, it's probably one of the strongest songs post Steve. And it resonates the most with non-fans. Definitely. Without being the Big Bang Theory theme. Right. (laughs) Which is going to resonate with the most people. But I think Gonna Walk, (laughs) you could, you you can use it and introduce. It's true enough to what the band really is and open enough for new people to like the band from it. I think that this is a great song to play live because it is so that call and answer he has a great time with the audience on it it just is a lot of fun Mm -hmm. so yeah i think i definitely a four definitely in the four area all right so i mentioned earlier what the appearance was going to be uh we have that already in there you know i i really i had a lot of fun recording tonight like this this was definitely you know i i want to thank you for joining me It it was good times yes thank you Oh, you're quite welcome. We'll have to have you on again in the future so that we can have a good time with another song. Are you saying what next week's song is, then? I I am. Yes. I am. Yes. Next week's song is Good Times off the same album, off the Persuasions album. Well, just keep me in mind for Fog of Writing. Well, I have the thing open right now. I will put you right down for Fog of Writing. Yes. You've got it. <laughs> I'll start preparing Wait a minute. We're, wait a minute. We're on the G's. Wait, oh yeah, darn it. <laughs> oh man. It took me a second. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm going by that as I look at this. I'm, I swear <laughs> I, I can write and know the alphabet. <laughs> and I'm, You thought we were counting backwards. You thought it was a, a drug a drug test. Yeah, exactly. A drug uh, a test. So, we, you thought we hadn't reached there yet. So. Why did I? But yes, we... We'll definitely have you on for another song. Okay. You know, feel free to pick any songs that you like uh, that you want to be on because this was this was a lot of fun. Excellent. Have a great week and thanks. That was fun. Celebrate joining Pantheon Podcasts, Rock Camp, the podcast, the official podcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, is giving away a guitar signed by Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater, Marty Friedman, formerly of Megadeth, and legendary shredder Zach Wild, plus our rock star counselors like Vinny Apice, Monty Pittman, and more. To enter to win, simply follow, rate, and review our podcast on your preferred platform, and that's all you have to do. For more information, go to rockcamp.com forward slash podcast.